This is Let Me Sum Up, your regular deep dive into recent reports on climate and energy. I'm Luke Menzel, recording today on Wurundjeri Land, and I'm joined, as always, by my two co-hosts, the exceptional Alison Reeve. G'day, Alison. Hello, Luke. And a man so committed to posting policy hot takes on X that he does so even through a COVID-induced haze, Tenant Reed. G'day, Tenant. And uh, all I hope is that uh, the fever does not lead to some kind of career detonating rant that will uh, echo through the the archives for decades to come. <laughs> <laughs> On this week's show, we look at the emissions that remain when we hit net zero and the quality of national plans for dealing with them. But first, the Victorian Premier, Jacinta Allen, has released the long-awaited strategy for the revamped State Electricity Commission, or SEC. The SEC was a victim of energy sector privatisation in the 1990s, and its resurrection was one of the big announcements from the Labor government during last year's state election campaign. Tenant, this uh, strategy put some flesh on the bones of some of the things we already knew, but it also contained one or two big surprises, right? That's right. Uh, Flesh on the bones we knew about and some additional limbs unfolding themselves from the chitinous carapace of the (laughs) SECV Mark II. Uh, It's a really interesting document. And so the, the things that it addresses broadly are large-scale clean energy plans, which is what we mostly thought it was going to be about. There's, as expected, a billion dollars of public investment to help enable four and a half gigawatts of clean capacity, ultimately, uh, with an immediate focus on batteries, two to four hour large-scale batteries. Uh, Not particularly uh, intense emphasis in the document on offshore wind, which uh, some people thought that SECV Mark II would would wind up being the vehicle for. Uh, That that so far is is not the case. A little less expectedly, uh, it's going to be taking over the uh, VRET 1 and 2 contracts uh, and retailing power to the Victorian government and retailing power to smaller commercial and industrial customers. Uh, the other limbs, though, are pretty interesting. So there's a home electrification push that's a part of this, which I didn't see coming. Uh, there's a, a major uh, push around workforce with uh, a headline of 59,000 jobs to be supported through the SECV. I think uh, people working for it are are very keen to emphasise it will not be directly employing 59,000 people. Uh, There's there's no uh, 59,000 positions about to hit seek, uh, but uh, they're paying a lot of attention to the skills needs and the training uh, that will be required uh, to enable that. And then there's some input, uh, there's some material in there about governance, which has not shown up on most of the uh, people's reports of what was most exciting about this, but is uh, pretty important and uh, pretty interesting, uh, both a, a maybe a showy element that we could discuss, which is that uh, the SECV is going to be written into the state constitution. And the less showy but potentially very important fact that it's going to be fully subject to a competitive neutrality regime. Uh, The SECV will be practising cost-reflective pricing. It'll be subject to the same tax regime as uh, private businesses. There's maybe some room for for question about uh, what its borrowing costs will be, but this is absolutely not a return to before the 1990s or, or to 1918 when SECV Mark I was established. Uh, this is going to be a, a a different beast and one that is not a full repudiation of uh, the, the way things have been done in recent decades. There's a lot to break down in those those areas, but uh, it's it's a, overall, I would say, a, a very interesting and good start for... A, a a very ambitious a, a body that's got so many hopes and expectations vested in it 
after that election campaign when like this uh, and a couple of other things seemed to catch fire in the public consciousness, mostly positively, some people hating it, uh, it's got a lot to deliver on and, and people might be maybe surprised by what it ends up doing versus what they thought it would. Well, I mean, the governance stuff is super interesting, but the thing that really caught my eye was uh, uh, this this role for the SEC in uh, electrification of the 1.7 million odd homes in Victoria that we need to get off gas over the next couple of decades, which I, I think was was uh, a bit of a surprise um, to most stakeholders. It wasn't certainly wasn't something that came up in the course of the election campaign. Um, and um, the thing that's been exercising my mind is is what the government actually means when it's calling the SEC a one-stop shop. Um, there's one thing that's very clear um, based on uh, sort of the Minister's pronouncements uh, and indeed uh, the announcement from the Premier Jacinta Allen on this. Um, they're really concerned about um, misinformation that's out in the market as they perceive it around electrification and they are really keen to see the SEC play a role as a bit of a clearinghouse for um, consumers that are trying to get their head around um, the pathway off gas. But in in policy circles, one-stop shops imply a bit more than just providing information, um, which begs the question, well, what else is it doing? Is it pointing to reputable providers? Is it supporting households to engage with, you know, um, white certificate schemes like the Victorian Energy Upgrades Program? Is it helping to upgrade households itself? Um, This is all a little bit unclear. That story is yet to be written. What I can say is that the Premier made the announcement about the ECC at an event, um, Careers for Net Zero, which was co-hosted by the EEC and the CEC a couple of weeks ago. Um, So I had the opportunity to um, put a couple of questions to uh, the Minister after the announcement. And I said, well, you know, does all this mean that someone in a polo shirt uh, with an SEC logo on it is going to be turning up to homes and swapping out gas hot water systems for heat pumps? And she's like, "Mm, well, you know, pilots next year. Um, to be determined. Like, she certainly wasn't shutting that idea down. She didn't rule it in or out. Um, But there's clearly an emerging story about, you know, the role that they see the SEC having in kind of catalyzing this market. And it's going to be super interesting. Um, uh, One thing's for sure, it's a huge task. And as we've discussed on this um, podcast before, um, business as usual is unlikely to get you there. Um, but as always, when the government gets into um, markets, one has to do so very carefully to make sure that um, it is uh, complementary to you know the activities of the private sector rather than grading the private sector out, which is a bit of a theme across uh, a number of the new areas of uh, the SEC's operations. Yeah, I I think that's what is different about this SEC versus the old SEC. It's going into a different world where the private sector does play in a lot of different areas that used to be SEC territory, which means that when you talk about things like competitive neutrality and cost-reflective pricing, we're not just talking about electricity tariffs. We're talking about how does it use its market power, you know, amongst the numerous small businesses out there who are trying to set up a one-stop electrification Mm. shop. Um, So it's going to be getting into a lot of different places and that's going to make it, I think, quite a potentially quite a interesting organisation internally as well. It's going to, you know, be, I don't know, I don't want to say like a a many-headed hydra, um, (laughs) but it is, you know, it is going to be playing in a lot of different spaces. And one of the interesting things is when you look at energy retail businesses who've tried to do that, they've actually found it quite hard. Um, and the question we sort of need to ask is why is it going to be any different for the SEC compared to the way that it's been for energy retailers or other parts of the energy sector? Should we talk a bit about the stuff they're meant to build? Oh, yeah. So they've got a billion dollars. That's all right. (laughs) Um, It's better than a poke in the eye. (laughs) Better than a poke in the eye. Although a billion dollars doesn't go very far far. these days. (laughs) Inflation. (laughs) Inflation. (laughs) Back in my day, a billion dollars would buy your whole power system. Yeah, <laughs> yes, indeed. So they've got a billion dollars. They have a goal of getting four and a half gigawatts of new renewable generation. That's around 20% of Victoria's annual electricity consumption at the moment. 
And depending on where you think electricity prices are going to go, that might be worth $250 million. It might be worth $500 million. So there's a hell of a lot of uncertainty in revenue that they're dealing with here. Yep. And how much they actually get for their billion really depends on how much leverage they get. So, you know, they, they've got this goal of 51% equity over time, but that might mean that they're putting sort of smaller dobs of money around the place in order to leverage a lot more private sector capital. We're kind of really unclear out of the um, the strategic document actually how exactly they're going to do that. And the other thing that's going to be quite interesting about this is how much return they make because part of the promise of the SEC was that it was going to keep electricity prices down. They keep electricity prices down, their returns are going to be lower and they're going to have this tension to manage between, you know, what the Victorian Treasury puts on them in terms of conditions around making a return mm. And the promise of keeping electricity prices low, they they potentially end up in a position where the more successful they are, they, are, they start to put themselves out of business, which, you know, in, in traditional policy terms means that the market failure has gone away and so therefore there is no role for government anymore. Um, maybe that's the exit strategy. I don't know. Because that's an exit strategy that's been employed so many times before by government entities playing in the electricity <laughs> market. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> um, I had my first job in this sector um, with a New South Wales government agency, which was meant to transform the energy market within three years and then get out. And that was in 2000. Um, and here we are. Here we are. Three, three Aztec calendar great years. <laughs> but, and how does that, how does that vision, um, you know, if there in, is indeed some future in which the SEC is no longer required, uh, fit with this uh, being written into the state? Constitution. I'm glad you asked me that, Luke, because I have very strong feelings about this point. Mm. So part of the promise is that they are going to write into the Victorian Constitution the existence of the State Electricity Commission. And this is actually building on a rather unfortunate habit that successive Victorian governments have developed, which is popping things that they particularly feel strongly about and don't want future governments to unpick into the Constitution. Currently in the Victorian Constitution, there's a ban on um, fracking. Mm -hmm. There is a provision to keep water services in public ownership. Um, and there is potentially going to be the SEC. Now, no other state does this, right? You can go and look at all the other state constitutions and they have all of just the traditional vanilla things that are in your constitution, right? What your parliament does, what your judges do, what the governor does, how often you're going to have elections, just all of that sort of stuff. That is what constitutions are there for. They're about the roles and powers of different branches of government and how they relate to each other. They are not there to stop the opposition changing things when they get into power, right? And in the Victorian constitution, those things that I mentioned before, the fracking and the water stuff, cannot be changed unless 60% of both houses approve a bill to change them, which in a two-party system effectively means that you need bipartisan support mm -hmm. to do it. And given that they were all put in there by one side of government who has that one role about big government and it's the other side of government would also need basically to change something quite fundamental about their policy in order to change it, they're never going to change. And if you keep on doing this, this is actually quite – anti-democratic in my view, right? A, a majority of Victorians in the future may want to lift the ban on fracking. They may want to change the nature and the form of the SEC mm. and they may vote in a government on that basis, but that government would not be able to change those things in the constitution unless the opposition was also prepared to come to the party. And it just makes, it just makes me quite cranky because this is just, you don't muck around with constitutions, Right? Mm. Constitutions are very important foundation documents. They are not places where you park things that you just feel very strongly about. And that's all I'm going to say about the Constitution. Yes. I would also say just that uh, there's some more questions to be answered about this competitive neutrality thing because in other areas of policy and uh, the energy market even where competitive neutrality principles are applied, one of the things that that involves is making, say, the Queensland government's energy network businesses pay the same cost of capital, the same cost of debt as commercial 
players would, which means that the state government borrows cheaply and then the Treasury tax on a surcharge on the debt that it passes on to the network business. And this uh, actually annoys a lot of people because it means that the Queensland government is um, taxing electricity users for allegedly competition-related reasons that that give it a much higher return on the deployment of capital than the regulators have to assume. Whatever. The point is that in this context... Are they going to do, is the Victorian government going to apply a competitive cost of debt to SECV Mark II? I would think not because it kind of defeats the whole point of doing this. Like the the key thing that this entity is meant to be able to do that will help lower costs is borrow more cheaply or mm. take more risks for a given cost of, um, of debt because the state stands behind it. Uh, so if it can do that, that's really interesting, and uh, but also won't fully match up to competitive neutrality principles. It, it, even more so than like networks don't compete with each other, uh, but uh, entities like the SEC and commercial entities do compete with each other. So I don't know. It all seems a bit messy in in practice, and I, I don't quite know how it's going to play out. There's going to be an interesting question there too about what kind of dividends the Victorian Treasury expects it to pay back. Yeah. One of the things that has happened consistently with a lot of state-owned electricity businesses, not just in Queensland but in New South Wales before it was privatised as well, was Treasuries were very fond of stripping out quite generous dividends out of those businesses in order to have more money to put into consolidated revenue. Yeah. And that is at odds with we're trying to keep prices down because where those dividends come from is from consumers. People complain about like uh, rapacious short-termist attitudes in uh, stockholder capitalism. Yeah, they ain't met a treasury yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll uh, watch the, uh, what do you call it, tenant? Kittiness. The chitinous carapace of the alien like entity. The Hydra. Uh, the many headed Hydra. <laughs> is burst forth from the, uh, the body of the SEC. <laughs> This is a very negative description. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna have to get a little logo that looks like Pikachu or something just to reassure everybody. That, that would be much nicer than uh, the HR Geiger design I seem to be implying. Right. Well, uh, we'll watch all that with interest. Shall we chat about a report? Let's do that. Oh, yeah. The concept of net zero emissions is built on the insight that even the most ambitious mitigation pathway will leave us with some residual emissions that will need to be balanced out with carbon removals from the atmosphere. This makes the expected level of residual emissions very important, as it defines the ongoing carbon removal task the world will face beyond 2050. However, a paper titled Why Residual Emissions Matter Now finds that national approaches to projecting residual emissions vary wildly. The authors reviewed 50 of the long-term low emissions developed strategies submitted to the UNFCCC under the Paris Agreement and found that residual emissions aren't defined consistently, are calculated in a wide variety of ways, and are rarely considered in light of the carbon removal options available. Alison, uh, you put this paper on our radar. What did you make of it? I picked it up because I thought it was answering a really interesting question, right? Like how big is the net in, in mm. net zero? Mm. Um, and the answer they came up with is... Um, pretty bloody big, actually. <laughs> There's a lot of net going on. Um, but it also, I think, had some other interesting points in here that in some ways that question is hard to answer mm. because not everyone talks about the net mm. in the same way. People use different language. Um I moderated a panel a few weeks ago, which was a joint Australia-Japan thing. And in Japan, they talk about carbon neutral, not net zero. And so throughout this panel, I had to refer to our joint commitment to net zero carbon neutral by 2050, which was like a massive mouthful. So th there's not a lot of consistency around how people even refer to this. There's not a lot of consistency around how people measure it. And one of the things that they're sort of calling for, I think, through this paper is we need to get better at this because if we don't have a sensible idea of how big our net is, 
then it's very hard to actually calibrate the rest of our policies. You sort of need to think of that in terms of what what signals are you sending to the fossil fuel sector about how long they're going to persist for. And there's also, I think there was another interesting point that they raised is, is the net there forever or is it mm. only a temporary state? Mm. You know, is, is the net going to shrink over time um, or is it something where stuck with forever and always. And those are, that's actually quite a profound question around how fast we go on things like technology deployment and on R&D and, and those sorts of things. And also, you know, at the moment, we all just sort of think about 2050 as this hard stop point, but pretty soon we're actually going to have to start thinking about what comes beyond that. And that story is going to be quite different depending on whether net is forever or net is a temporary state. And it's a big deal, right? Because, you know, they tallied a bunch of stuff up and um, countries are projecting pretty big levels of residual emissions. Um, they found about 18% of current emissions if you tally it all up. And to go to your point, Alison, um, you can imagine a scenario where we do really well and that's like it's 18% at 2050 and steadily declining. So the task of carbon removals goes down over time as well. But there's an alternative reality where we're at some kind of steady state where we're continuing to meet at that level. And then we've got to find um, a whole bunch of sequestration opportunities to um, uh, balance uh, those ongoing emissions. And that's a, that's a, a huge task um, and, and something which I, I don't think, as we discussed in the paper um, that we uh, we canvassed back at the start of the year um, on the state of carbon dioxide removal, uh, I think back on episode 18, uh, that's a task that countries aren't really grappling with in any, any kind of serious way. Yeah, I mean, I think they, they found that if they extrapolated from this sample to all countries, you would end up needing 12 gigatons a year of removals. And I was having real trouble getting my head around how big that even was. And so I went and looked up how much the world's forests absorb now, and they're about 7.6 gigatons. Hmm. So we would need three times the amount of forest that we've got now, roughly. <clears throat> in order to absorb all of that. And they do also make the point there that that 12 gigatons is potentially an underestimate mm. um, because it doesn't include international shipping or international aviation, and those are pretty big. And they also noted that they went off the most ambitious scenarios that were in all of the uh, long-term strategies that people had submitted. Yeah, this is the best case scenario. <laughs> This is the best case. Best case scenario, three times as much forest as we have worldwide now. So you can't cut down anything that we've already got yeah. and you need to plant lots starting from now. There was, a, there was another – the other thing that was sort of I think interesting in this too was that they saw these all of this as having quite some implication for – I suppose what we used to call contraction and convergence, what we sort of now think of as a sort of just transition between countries, they made the point that developing countries may feel that they get more claim on residual emissions given that they didn't historically cause the problem. And the sample of countries that they had here were just developed countries. Yep. So, again, we could well be underestimating. Well, that. And there's also the, the world of net negative emissions, right? Yeah. If we're using up all of this space for sequestration to just, you know, continue absorbing the emissions that we're continuing to pump out into the atmosphere beyond 2050, um, the prospects, which, you know, many look to with some hope of actually getting to a world of net negative emissions where we're actually drawing more from the atmosphere, um, the, then we are uh, emitting into it. Um, they disappear into the proverbial puff of smoke, right? Because it's taking up the, it's literally taking up the same space. So it's worth dwelling a little bit on the method by which they've sought to answer this question, because they, as as you've both referred to, this is a report about analysing the contents of the long-term strategies for low emissions development that have been submitted so far under the Paris Agreement. Paris Agreement asks countries to do a lot of things. One of those things is to come up with these strategies. And it's a little bit fuzzy if they're sort of one strategy forever or if they're a regularly updated or constantly updated thing. At the time that this report was put together, 51 countries had done their long-term strategies. And so as with some other reports that we've done, 
uh, in in past episodes, these things that countries submit to the, uh, under the Paris Agreement are a sort of a, an analytical gold mine uh, for researchers to go to and mine out what did they say about this topic, what kind of words did they use, what level of analysis did they provide, and so on. So I think we re- need to keep those uh, documentary origins very firmly in mind here because those long-term strategies are all a bit different from each other. Uh, They are all, like I think it would be fair to say, at least works in progress, and some of them are just a bit rubbish. Uh, And we know that because one of them is Australia's long-term strategy, (laughs) the existing one from late 2021, which Uh, some people call the pamphlet. It's it's a pretty long pamphlet, but it is a very... (laughs) Uh, it's a document that shows its origins in being the product of a government that was sort of at war with itself on the topic, had very difficult no-go areas to try and talk around, wasn't widely consulted, was trying to contort itself to, to say that various things would be achieved without any notable policies to do so, and uh, you know was trying to navigate things like what's going to happen to our fossil fuel exports. It was using a scenario analysis that suggested we would uh, be exporting uh, about half the value of coal in 2050 that we were exporting in 2020, which is, uh, you know, maybe a way for a government to start inching itself towards recognising some of the realities of a net zero world, but it's still some distance away from those realities. So uh, the point of me talking about that is is not to say, you know, this was a uniquely bad strategy or, or whatever. I mean, you know, in, in the context that it came from, it was remarkable it existed at all. But every national strategy is going to have some sagas behind it. And, of course, they are not collectively or individually going to be that coherent. Uh, so I think this this research is actually really good and, and useful to highlight that uh, all this stuff is, is very embryonic and has a lot of improvement and mutual consistency to, to build towards. But it's no surprise that things don't add up. And I don't think we should take it as saying, like, the world is on track for 18% residual emissions. Yeah. It's more that um, nobody's quite done their sums with sufficient authority to build uh, rational solutions into national strategies writ large yet. I mean, they they did make the point that what's in someone's long-term strategy is not necessarily an indication of how seriously a government takes that scenario. Um, Just because you have a scenario doesn't mean it's necessarily the one you're going to pursue. And they also sort of pointed out this very different language around how you define a residual emission and how that might be an indication of how politically palatable and politically malleable Mm. your residual emissions are. So what are the varieties of a residual, Alison? Well, Some countries refer to emissions that you cannot eliminate. Cannot. Impossible. Some say they want to minimise residuals. Some say unavoidable. Some say economic. Some say unlikely to be eliminated. Mm. Some refer to within the current state of knowledge or the current state of technology. So there's all sorts of wriggle room there around what you consider to be a residual And a lot of those in these strategies also tie to the sort of emerging thing that we've got, which is the hard to abate sector. And we all just sort of merrily toss that phrase around, right, about hard to abate this and hard to abate that. But one of the things that they really draw out in quite a pointed way here, which I think is quite important, is there's also no consistent definition of what a hard to abate sector is. And... I, I sort of I think when we were looking at the, the sort of reforms around the safeguard last year and early this year, all of a sudden everybody was a hard to abate sector. So hot right now. It's so <laughs> hot right now because everyone wants to be in the hard to abate sector because then you don't have to do anything. H two A is the new E I T E. Do you say E I T E? Uh no, I say E T. E T. 
Right. Do, do we have a handy, uh, pronounceable alternative to hard to abate? Nobody has ever said H two A. I quite like H two A. All right, I reckon that works. It's sort of surely it's got to be H two. A, B with an 8 at the end, like the number 8, right? Oh. <laughs> it's the boy band of climate policy. <laughs> I reckon there's a cement executive out there who's got that as a number plate on their car. All right, all right. But I think Luke has proven that you can't be H2A, B8 uh, without sufficient hair product. The point of everything that you just outlined, Ellison, is that kind of at the heart of this is, you know, are residual emissions something unfortunate that happens to you or is it the result of choices that you make, right? And I think that that uh, um, governments around the world are still grappling with that, particularly when it comes to choices that are really hard to make. And the residual emissions, to a degree, in your most ambitious scenario, could be categorised as the things that, um, you know, some genuinely tricky things that we don't have solutions for, but then a bunch of stuff that is tricky because it's politically tricky or socially tricky, um, rather than, you know, necessarily technologically tricky. I think there's another definition that one could apply to uh, residual emissions, um, which is something you have to budget for based on your ability to remove carbon from the atmosphere down the track. And you actually work back, backwards from there because what was interesting through most of these uh, exercises that were analysed um, was that it most of them seem to be looking at the emissions in their economy and looking at the, the things that were, were tricky, um, telling them all up and saying, well, that's what's going to be left over at the end without necessarily drawing the line between their ability to net them off with a carbon removal activity. I mean, they, they the authors of this paper did propose that as the sort of the third way in which you could determine the size of your residuals is to say, well, I've got, I've got this capacity to... Um, to absorb carbon from the atmosphere, and so therefore my residual is going to be this big. What that that does do, though, is that there's a bit of a moral hazard in that. If you're a big country like Australia, like there there've been estimates from CSIRO, for example, of that we would have billions and billions and billions of tons worth of capacity um, to abate if we were prepared to turn vast areas of land over to planting trees on them and we didn't mind spending all the water on those as well. But, you know, your capacity to absorb carbon from the atmosphere is not necessarily a good measure of how large you should let your residuals be. It also ends up being sort of weirdly discriminatory against very small countries like, say, Singapore, who are kind of going to go, well, where are we going to put it all? So one possible answer to that uneven distribution of capacity to do carbon dioxide removal and uh, need, however defined, for carbon dioxide removal. One kind of answer to that is to say, let's construct some markets and have some trading that's going to sort that out. And uh, of course, there are a lot of challenges to that and pitfalls and hazards to that. But the 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 motivator is that you do have this uh, extreme unevenness of yeah. opportunity and need. Now, there may be other ways of coming at that. There may be better and worse market approaches. There are absolutely, as the uh, little discussed Article 6.8 of the Paris Agreement reminds us, non-market approaches to international cooperation. Uh, as well, but it, it is something to to work on. And the fact that in the fifty one long term strategies analysed broadly, uh, the uh, land based carbon sinks that were discussed by the the nations submitting those plans were not collectively sufficient to supply the amount of abatement of of, uh, carbon removal needed to match the residual emissions. That could imply a lot of things, including that they just haven't got coherent plans yet. But one of those is that they could expect a lot of international emissions trading uh, to other uh, economies, or they could expect a lot of engineered 
carbon dioxide removals, which are like the residual of the residual or the remainder of the remainder, the the magic term that expands as far as you need it to to make your commitments balance out, uh, that that could deal with a lot of light being shed on it in the next iteration of all these national plans too, including Australia's. I think I think we should, as the CCA was calling for, um, think much more explicitly about uh, the negative emissions that uh, we're going to rely on because we are going to rely on a bunch of them, even if it's not necessary. Australia had the highest reliance of any of we the did. 51 yes. on, yeah. uh, on residual emissions. We had close to 30% of our emissions being residual yeah. in 2050, Yeah, which I think was like 139 megatons or something like that. Yeah, partially because we still had this gigantic coal export industry in 2050 yeah. in the modelling that's standing behind the, uh, the LTS. So you can take that one to the bank. Well, but, but yeah, well, I mean, if you look at, there, there is an interesting chart in this paper where everyone says their residuals are coming from, from which, mm. which sectors. And I think Australia's biggest chunk was coming from the industrial sector, which would include fugitives and combustion emissions from um, coal and gas. Yeah. But I think it was also because at the time there was simply no sign of any policy in the industrial sector more broadly at all. And so that sector was just humming along. Um, If you look at the old projections charts from that era, it was just humming along forever and ever at the same level. So that's probably why that chunk was so big in, in our chart. We should talk a bit about agriculture and methane. Let's do it. <laughs> you shouldn't get excited about methane when you're under a blanket, Tenet. <laughs> uh, well, I will uh, shrug off that outrageous insult and say that uh, the, the exciting thing or the interesting thing here about methane is that methane emissions uh kind of fall into a a difficult place in this discussion of net zero. Arguably, they sit in a a very different place to the whole net zero construct. There's not going to be net zero anthropogenic methane emissions. Like, they're simply not. Uh, And uh, methane behaves differently in the atmosphere to carbon dioxide. It does break down. Uh, you don't get a continuous accumulation of uh, methane uh, concentrations with continuing emissions. What you do is as long as emissions are stable, you get a stable concentration of uh, methane in the atmosphere. The level that you stabilise at is a big deal for the total temperature forcing that you get. Uh, But uh, for climate stabilisation... You need uh, only to stabilise emissions of methane rather than uh, cancel out emissions with removals. Uh, for stable a stable climate, you need you absolutely need net zero emissions of carbon dioxide, which does accumulate. And so, dealing with both gases within the one rubric uh, leads to some confusion. And uh, the a significant chunk of the residual emissions for all these economies is ag emissions and Mm -hmm. most of them don't break out uh, which gases they're talking about, but most of the ag emissions are methane. So I I find that actually a a positive or or, or optimistic takeout from this. Uh, We do have a very big task both to stabilise methane emissions and to stabilise them at the the lowest level we can achieve, Uh, but uh, some of that 18% residual is not as big a worry, I think, for uh, the the risk of just totally out of control emissions that we're really just putting a... um, uh, an imaginary band-aid on in assuming a certain amount of uh, removal later. Uh, some of it is methane that is difficult to manage but manageable in a different way to CO2. Am I being too sunny? Uh, look, I think that, you know, 
to the degree that there's ambiguity in some of these long-term strategies, um, I think it's fair to say that that ambiguity will resolve itself into some some uh, more positive outcomes and some more negative outcomes. Um, it's kind of like the concept of starting with the end in mind. Like countries haven't properly thought through what a net zero economy looks like and kind of mm. some of the granular questions um, beyond like that big hashtag net zero um, imagining what that could be. And it makes sort of both the design of policy to target that potential endpoint um, and some of the conversations that we need to have now, in, uh, this year or next year or the next five or ten years, much more difficult to have because there's there's just a lot of fuzziness about where we're all, where we're all heading. And there are some things which will inevitably continue to be fuzzy for a long time because they're, they're hard, to un- hard to unpack, hard to understand. Um, we we don't quite have the answers yet, but there's other things like that, which, you know, by kind of unpicking and building literacy around the difference between CO2, which accumulates in the atmosphere and, and uh, methane, which have, has this, has this other, these other characteristics, like that could be incredibly helpful um, for, you know, informing the public debate, informing public policy. It's interesting, the, the comment that you made earlier, Tenant, around analysing these uh, documents is both interesting but fraught with a certain amount of peril because, you know, they're kind of like thinking out loud exercises from a bunch of different governments that are sort of applying very different levels of attention and uh, sophistication uh, and capacity and capability to um, developing these documents. But, um, I mean, there's value in them just because they're almost like the subconscious sort of musings of, of governments around the world made uh, made manifest. It's like an internal monologue <laughs> of climate policy. Um, and I think what we can take out of, you know, this analysis of that internal monologue is there's they're nowhere near enough granular detail about residual emissions and how we're going to get them and how on earth can we pursue a net zero economy if we don't have the, the kind of the fundamentals of what net zero means, mm. you know, some three decades hence, kind of worked out, even if in its basic form and function. So these are sort of like a functional MRI scan of the brains <laughs> of the climate departments of 51 countries. Hmm. And and they're revealing a lot of, I don't know, panic shrieking, uh, tumbleweeds, uh, insufficiently fully thought through concepts so far. Well, a long-term strategy it's an indication of where a government was able to get to by a particular deadline. Yeah. It's kind of hiding all of those debates and processes and backstabbing of prime ministers and everything else that was going on within that country and coming up with a document that basically represents a sort of a nicely overlapping Venn diagram of things that are true and things that a particular set of politicians are prepared to say in public. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, ideally, that would be a circle. Um, But in practice, it is not. And the two circles sort of, you know, move closer together and and further away from each other, depending on where the debate is at in a country. It is, I mean, there's probably a whole other field of research of just like coming back to these long-term strategies again and again and again over 30 years and just seeing how well they're refining and how the language is changing and how that's reflecting the politics and and everything else. But they're not like a one-and-done product either, right? Yep. They're going to change, which, and I mean, you know, they're also sort of pointing that out, that we've got the opportunity to change them. And that's actually one of the sort of strengths of the Paris Agreement is that there is this flexibility for everyone to define their own terms, to draw their own Venn diagram. But if we're going to have an international agreement of some sort, we do need some basic rules that are the same. And one of the ones they're suggesting is that we need to get a standard definition of what a residual is. Because without that, the too hard basket is going to get too full too quickly. Um, And I think one of their concerns was in particular that it would get filled up by the wealthier countries who don't want to have the political debates at the expense of the less wealthy countries um, who may have more claim um, on being allowed to omit a bit more for a bit longer. So Australia's just launched the process uh, fairly recently of updating its long-term strategy. Uh, There's this elaborate process of sector plans and tying it all together and some work happening within the government and some 
work happening in the Climate Change Authority and we're going to knit it all together in 2024-25 into a, a, a new product that will be more sophisticated and certainly much more consulted on and discussed than long-term strategy 1.0. What, apart from being very clear about what hard to abate means, what do you reckon are the, the biggest things that that should take on from from this work and from the, the first round? Ooh, interesting question. Because one of the things we're going to see out of that process is how many people decide that they're the hard to abate sector. Yeah. Uh, yes. That, that is kind of one of the, the downsides of doing it as a um, – you know, as as a series of of sectoral ser- series of sectoral strategies, one I think one of the things that they should take out of this is exactly what is our expectation of the land sector to mop up mm. all of these residuals. We have been kind of lucky in that you know the the land sector has just been there as this sort of infinite bucket into which we can keep throwing emissions and it keeps absorbing it, but that's not. You know, it does have an, it does have an upper limit on it. So I think actually having a much more realistic picture of what you're expecting to get out of the land sector, and therefore what everybody else has to do in order to avoid the residual problem, would be one part of it. I think that Elson's point around you know the the pros and cons of sectoral decarbonisation pathways um, is well made. I think one of the the challenges the government will have, and I, I've been a strong supporter. Um, of the idea that sectoral decarb uh, plans are a good thing to do and a good way to engage sectors and, you know, do some detailed thinking about particular challenges and opportunities in uh, particular parts of the economy. Um, but you need to pull it all together in something into something that's coherent overall, right? Mm. And that's the integrative task that this paper points to, that it's all the it's just maths in the end, right? It's all got to add up to that number at the end of the day and with and you know, with a with an eye both to an endpoint that can be maintained from twenty fifty, but also the cumulative emissions between now and then, which is kind of our our contribution to the the um, maintaining the, the global carbon budget. And so there needs to be a pretty high threshold to saying that's too hard because if everybody says it's too hard, then we don't get where we need to be. It's got to be genuinely too hard, which goes to the point around definitions of hard to abate. And given the current state of definitions for things like hard to abate, things like residual emissions, I think Australia's got the opportunity to make a significant contribution to that global conversation about how we define these things by actually, you know, grappling with those concepts doesn't mean that's the end point that everybody's going to immediately agree with us, but by taking on that task in good faith um, and saying, well, we're going to we're going to be very clear about what we mean yeah. by these concepts and by these terms, that will both help build a more informed debate locally, but also something that can be looked at globally and saying, well, that's how the Australians did it. How would we approach that same task? Yeah. I think you raised a good point there, Luke, too, about the carbon budget also matters. Mm. So if you've decided that you're a hard to abate sector and you're going to rely on residuals, you actually need to, for the sake of the carbon budget, you need to start investing in that in that now. You you actually need to start offsetting if that's what you're gonna do. You need to start doing that now. It does it's not just you know, you'll get to 2049 and then go, oh, okay, I'm residual now, so I'll just buy some offsets next year because you would have pumped a huge amount of CO2 into the atmosphere and blown our budget in the meantime. Although, do you, so another aspect of, of conceptual blurring that um, went on to some degree earlier this year is the blur between difficulty in physically abating versus difficulty in paying for abatement. Uh, and uh, some people uh, argued both that uh, they couldn't do it and they couldn't afford to pay for somebody else to do it, or because they couldn't do it, they shouldn't have to pay for somebody else to do it. These are different issues, uh, even if they may overlap in a, a, a given industry uh, but or, or company. There's a lot to unpack there. I, so I, I very much agree that the single biggest thing that we can do to help domestically and internationally in this process is to be very clear about what we mean and what the opportunities are. I, If I was going to add one more thing for the uh, the national 
plan version two to be clear about, it would be what relationship we see Australian abatement having with international abatement, Mm -hmm. both in terms of will we, to the extent that we have uh, biogenic and engineered carbon removal potential, will we open that up to the world and do some of that for others, uh, whether for uh, remuneration or uh, as our gift to the world, Uh, but also uh, to the extent that other countries can do those things, are we going to place any potential reliance on that in our plans? And you can make arguments every which way for both of those things, but uh, I think really... Grappling with those questions and having a firm view is going to be pretty important to know where we stand. If uh, local industries knew that they would have to compete uh, with every other potential hard to abate uh, or, or wanting to pay for more to be done than they can do themselves player in the world for the opportunities within Australia. That's a that's a different thing again to pitch your, well, how hard to abate am I really calculations against? I'm just not sure whether to be devastated or delighted that we've got through this entire conversation without a Dax joke. <laughs> Yes. Well, (laughs) beneath my blanket, uh, I make no claims about whether there are DACs or not. There it is. (laughs) Look, they they did look, the the authors do make the good point that if you're relying on DACs rather than on the land sector, that is going to mean you're going to need more energy and that diverts resources away from everything else. And that's yet another reason um, for people to really consider just how hard to abate am I? Um, because if you decide you're going to rely on DAX, potentially those are resources that you could have had for your sector, whether that's capital or solar panels or workers or whatever it is. There's no joke in that at all. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm resisting the temptation and I'm going to continue resisting the temptation. <laughs> Good lad. <laughs> all right. Are we good? Do you have other things you want to say about this paper? It's interesting. It was only six pages of, of text and there was just, was a lot. I just went, there's good. so many ideas in yeah. it. Yeah. And I will also say it's kind of, like it's not completely, but it's kind of a null result paper. Mm. They, they went looking to see uh, what coherent thoughts countries had had and they don't <laughs> really. <laughs> and that's in itself an interesting result that's worth knowing and discussing. So yes. yay to anybody who publishes a null result. As always, we close out the show with one more thing in which we all share something that is currently captivating our attention. Tenant, what have you got? I would like to highlight a significant speech that the treasurer of this great nation, Australia, the Honourable Jim Chalmers, MP, made to the Australians Economic and Social Outlook Conference recently, where he laid out the clearest thinking that the government has yet articulated on this whole what should Australia do to try and match or compete with or learn from the US Inflation Reduction Act and basically said that the government will do a set of big things in or between now and the 2024-25 budget and that these big things will they will involve money but they will also involve a bunch of other things that are important need to haves for industrial superpower, clean energy stuff to happen, uh, including uh, faster decision-making on approvals and skills and infrastructure and uh, supply chains to support these things. What things? He laid out some tests for what is worth pursuing uh, in, in this area of policy, tests including, notably, Do we have a prospect of actually being competitive in whatever it is? And he said the four broad areas that had uh, passed those tests so far in the government's thinking were processing of transition minerals, uh, the production of uh, hydrogen and ammonia for export, the production of at least some manufactured components for 
a clean economy, particularly uh, seems still to be thinking about uh, batteries or elements mm. of batteries playing a role there, and green metals, and obviously all of the renewable energy to generation to enable all of those things. So exactly what that's going to turn into, how many zeros will be involved in the spendy element of it, who knows, but uh, it's a pretty good speech. Pretty sensible uh, if a bit, for some people's taste, a bit high level, uh, but not a bad start, I thought. I would rather have it high level at this stage. I want them to think about it properly if it's got a lot of zeros on the end of it. Yes. I'm glad to hear the uh, Treasurer is heeding the uh, Let Me Sum Up podcast calls for a coherent industrial policy as we transition to net zero emissions. Uh, very gratifying. I'm sure we were the critical voice <laughs> on that front. <laughs> Chalk up one to the metrics. You never hear that kind of thing out of the Treasury. So <laughs> glad somebody's here to stiffen the spine of those those arts graduates. <laughs> Well, on a related question, did you uh, did you see these new marching orders that have been given to the Productivity Commission? Yes, some uh, passive aggression in those <laughs> marching orders. It wants useful advice, <laughs> relevant, more relevant, particularly uh, with reference to Australia navigating the climate transition. So it'll be really interesting yes. to see how that's picked up and operationalised by our friends at the PC. Yeah, yeah, like a, a prominent new uh, advisory role on uh, Net Zero in addition to all the important things they already do. And I, for one, think that's terrific. Uh, Mm. And uh, I look forward to all of us in stakeholder land getting to engage with the PC as it goes about that additional function. And stuff like carbon border adjustments (laughs) is ripe for uh, more uh, practical and uh, useful advice. That op-ed from earlier the year is is just uh, continuing to stick in your craw, isn't it, (laughs) Tennant? Onward and upward, say I. (laughs) All right, uh, Alison, what have you got? So I have a transcript which was published on a website called Phenomenal World, which is um, a very good publication out of the US, which just focuses on political economy. So the whole how how are governments going to make decisions about um, about various stuff? But this was a really interesting discussion about how the world can go about net navigating energy security and geopolitics and economic prosperity as they go through this period where you've got fossil fuels on the decline and renewables on the rise and you're in this very messy crossover period where fossil fuels have not yet declined to the point where we can ignore them and renewables have not yet grown to the point where they dominate. It's an incredibly interesting read. Mm. It goes all the way through Ukraine and China oil stocks and critical minerals and all sorts of things. So definitely recommend taking a look at it. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to checking that one out. Uh, All right. Well, I've got a read as well. Uh, Long-time listeners will know that if there is a big bad of the Let Me Sum Up Cinematic universe. It is William Nordhaus and his unholy legion of integrated assessment models. So I was intrigued to come across an article on The Intercept uh, with the clickbaity title of When Idiot Savants Do Climate Economics, uh, which uh, is effectively an epic takedown of IEMs for a, a lay audience. So it covers the IEM critique from Nicholas Stern, Joe Stiglitz and Charlotte Taylor that we covered back on episode seven. Uh, It covers that in some detail. It even touches on the paper on apocalyptic climate scenarios that we covered on episode 10. Um, And and this article um, was so critical of Bill Nordhaus that it made you, Tennant, feel a little bit sorry for him. I did, I did, and for his his students and friends and people who'd half smile in his direction, who also copped a spray in the course of this somewhat mean article. I, I think I think somebody can be considerably wrong about yeah. a lot of stuff and still make a, a contribution in the march towards greater rightness sure. of. Society and Bill Nordhaus, as as crap and laughable as some of the uses of his work have been, uh, I I think is not like the Ebola virus of climate economics. Uh, I, I, I think 
I think his existence is not to be completely regretted. There is good in him. <laughs> Even if he just shows us what not to do, right? <laughs> Don't do what, what Billy don't does. Uh, anyway, it's yes. a fun read. And if uh, you have someone in your life that could do with getting across uh, the critiques of IEMs but is unlikely to labour through several hours of Let Me Sum Up episodes, uh, this snappy 20-minute read yep. could be for them. Uh, just, just find them something that's nice about economists afterwards. <laughs> yes. Uh <laughs> Alison, I understand you have one more one more thing. I do have one more one more thing. This is my last episode on Aww. Let Me Sum Up because the incomparable and inimitable Frankie Muscovich will be back in two weeks. Um, which if you have been trying to figure out what our email address is, <laughs> is that's great news. <laughs> Frankie will be back to re- read it clearly at the end of every episode. Um, uh, but look, I just wanted to say thanks very much, guys, for um, this has been tremendous fun. I've read a bunch of stuff that I would never have got around <laughs> to reading, so that's a result. And it's just been a, it's just been a real blast. And I um, also just want to say thank you to all the people who have let me know at various events and through emails and everything that they've listened in and they've enjoyed it. It's so lovely to get that feedback. So thank you. Mm. Alison, you won't be surprised to hear that I'm looking forward to having Frankie back on the podcast. Um, But it has been so fun doing this with you and I'm slightly devastated that we won't be catching up in this format every couple of weeks. Uh, The only consolation is that you have indicated that whenever one of us is waylaid, you're willing to sweep in and once again raise the tone of the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Once a king or queen in Narnia, always a king or queen in Narnia. (laughs) So if you want to hear more of me on the podcast, basically you need to make sure Tenet gets an infectious disease more often. (laughs) We found a new variation on Munchausen syndrome by proxy. (laughs) It's a podcast format now. Oh, dear me. Well... We will look forward to uh, having reason to have you back on the pod. And I have heard a rumour that you might be joining the three of us on the holiday special, Alison. So uh, listeners have that to look forward to as well. All right. That is our show for today. We're all on social media. Um, Actually, all three of us now are on Blue Sky, uh, which is very exciting. Thank you for the code, Tenant. Um, I wonder if Frankie's on Blue Sky. I guess we'll find out next episode yeah it's it's spreading like a plague (laughs) but it's like a very low low tempo sort of gentle uh environment plague rather than uh being that that twitter like so far so yes it's pretty pretty good and i just want to give a shout out to the listener with the chutzpah to email us and ask for a blue sky code uh that was very entrepreneurial of the of you (laughs) You should emphasise so that you don't get a lot more of those emails, Luke, that you did not give him. I did not give a blue sky code. I had, I, uh, I had to disappoint that listener, so uh, do not waste your time and email us for blue sky codes. They are not things that we have, and that is beyond the scope of this podcast. Alison, one last time, uh, we have an email address. Uh, what is it and what should people do with it? The email address is mailbag at letmesumup.net. People should send us an email. They can say hello. They can tell us they've enjoyed the show. They can give us suggestions of papers to add to the enormous. I looked at the pile the other day. Is it like it's over a hundred? Yes. Easily. Yes. Yeah. I would say that it is a fairly. It's a, it's like a well stocked refrigerator that needs to be cleaned out. <laughs> well, that's one yes, attitude. There, there are there are some papers that are bits of elderly celery rotting in the crisper. <laughs> You it more like a Genghis Khan pyramid of skulls. And if you have suggestions for a lovely fresh cheese that you want to put in our refrigerator of papers, uh, please send it to mailbag at letmesumup.net. Uh, and uh, Tenant, we have a website. We do. www.letmesumup.net is the place where you can browse through the pyramid of skulls we have successfully dealt with <laughs> so far to find... William Nordhaus and uh, pull up his skull and maybe do a, uh, a Hamlet Yorick type <laughs> scene wrench. 
that's your thing. Uh, all right. Well, uh, for uh, Tenant Reid and the exceptional Alison Reeve, I'm Luke Menzel. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you again soon. Has Frankie been wor- working on the T-shirt question? On <laughs> I suspect not. Days? An excellent question. An excellent question. And I'm going to leave this at the end of the episode for our friend Muscovich, <laughs> who made great claims about all the progress she was going to be making on T-shirts in the yes. interregnum. Yes. Because I only, I only did this gig for the T-shirt. <laughs> you promised me a T-shirt. That, I think we may, may have done, yeah. A small recompense for the many hours of labour you have put into this podcast. <laughs> But, Frankie, there you go. <laughs> Alison wants her T-shirt. Get on it. Well, if <laughs> regulatory limitations are relaxed, uh, a questionably ethical T-shirt could be <laughs> designed, <laughs> produced and dispatched in short order. But no, she's had how long? Plenty of time no, to get nothing out. Nothing going on. 100% organic, fair trade, single origin T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> 